things are better than when I started as an alderman back in 1971. Um, back then, we didn't um, have any easy way of communicating. We had, uh, so the city council votes on about 2,000 items a year, and the record of proceedings is a very thick double book uh, that's bound only in libraries sometimes. Um, so if you wanted to know, say, how your alderman was voted, you could go through the 2,000 pages and you know look for the alderman's name and see if you could figure out through it. Uh, when I was on the city council, they wouldn't even let us have access to the budget data of the city. Uh, we had to go to the comptroller's office with a pencil and a uh, yellow pad, even as aldermen, to get the data. Of course, citizens didn't even get that much help. So things have improved, and there's some specific improvements um, that have uh, happened uh, very recently, uh, some in the Emanuel administration, more when Lori Lightfoot took office. So one of the things that happens now is the city council meeting is web streamed, but it is also for the first time on CAN TV. It's only 30 years late. All they had to do was flip a switch 30 years ago and we could have seen on TV the city council meetings, but as we can the county board meetings. Uh, but we didn't do that, now they are broadcast. Uh, one of the huge advances is the dates of the city council meeting are known in advance, a really novel concept. <laughs> um, they're on a regular schedule and you can see the schedule. So that helps. And the city clerk's website um, does indeed uh, show some of the information, uh, which it didn't originally. I worked with four city clerks to get us to have any information. One of the problems is if you try and, let's say you're just an average citizen, you have a simple question. I'd like to know how my alderman's voting because I'd like to hold them accountable if they're voting the way I think they should say on the upcoming city budget when you're gonna be taxed an extra billion dollars and you might be curious how your alderman voted on that question. Um, it is now possible, but when you go to the clerk's website, this is what you see. It, you know, it does say about city government and the Chicago City Council, so you'd puzzle your way through and after you tried two or three times, uh, you might uh, find the correct place and then you would actually get lucky and find out about, you somehow stumbled into the section of the website that talks about the reports. And if you knew what you were looking for, so I said there are 2,000 votes, right? So you don't really care if they voted present at the city council meeting that they were there that day, or um, they sometimes have resolutions for Ma and Pa Smith's uh, 50th wedding anniversary. You know, everybody votes yes. You know, ask Washington for money. Everybody votes yes. So, you know, that doesn't really matter to you because it's not interesting. Uh, there's nothing substantial about it. But you might want to know how, like I say, with the budget vote, or you might like to know on the ethics ordinance that uh, uh, passed midsummer that was the biggest jump in ethics, did things like limit outside aldermanic employment, stuff like that. So you might want to know how your alderman did on those kinds of questions. Um, now we're jumping too far. So you would end up finally finding this page. You would begin to see that there were monthly reports, and I'm going to go to the clerk's actual website in a moment, not quite yet, uh, and show you how you get from this, which like monthly report on housing and real estate is the committee report, which is nice, we have it for the first time in Chicago history, but it isn't probably telling you what you wanna know. So it's very hard for the average citizen to make sense out of this. So what you wanna do is you want something more like what we do at the University of Illinois at Chicago. We list what the ordinance is, what the date it was, what its own individual number. By the way, when I started with Alderman, they didn't number the legislation. So that was another difficulty if you wanted to know what the bill was of the ordinance, as we call them in the city. And then you could find out that the vote was 46 to one or 25 to 24 and so forth from us. You can't 
find this on the city. They don't compile a single table where you could look up all the divided roll call votes at the same time and even tell what the outcome was. What we then do, and again, this is at the University of Illinois at Chicago, we translate this into a simple table, which with one meaning voting yes, zero meaning voting no, and so forth. It can also say yes and no if we wanted, but we do it this way for a reason for later uh, combining the information. Here we have how every alderman voted on every divided roll call vote. And this is one page from that. That would have let us eventually say something like, how did the alderman vote with the mayor on all of the divided roll call votes? Did they vote 100% of the time with the mayor, 71% of the time with the mayor, and so forth? And that would allow us as well to essentially take an x-ray of the city council. We can see how often, how many aldermen vote with the mayor. So that seven, in this particular one with Mayor Daly, Richard M. Daly, uh, seven voted 100% of the time, another 24 voted um, uh, for 90% or more of the time. We can compare that with Mayor Emanuel, and we see in Mayor Emanuel's last year in office, in fact, it was the most rubber stamp city council in the history of the city, which is useful to know. You know, you can then decide, well, I really like how Mayor Emanuel was governing the city. Alderman should have agreed with Mayor Emanuel 100% of the time. So now we want to go down to um, this, attendance and aldermanic and divided roll call vote. Supposing you hadn't given up long before this, you would actually get to this page on the last council meeting, July 24th, and scroll down one more page. So that tells you what it is. This tells you the actual vote. So for us to translate all of this back into that simple chart, which lists all the aldermanic votes, in which way every alderman voted, yes or no, um, takes 65 to 70 person hours per year. That is, if we want to get a year's worth of voting for every alderman, we still would have some trouble figuring out maybe your original question, how does Alderman Smith or Jones or Gonzalez end up voting on whatever things you care about? So our proposition is that the city clerk's website has a disconnect. It does not provide, because they're not looking at it from the point of view of either the citizen, the community group, or the civic organization. They're not saying to themselves, what we want to know is how the alderman actually voted in the simplest possible way. So I could enter a, smart, a, a search term like 43rd word alderman, and it would show me the voting record of the 43rd word alderman in some sensible way. I wouldn't have to go through either the, the thousands of pages of the journal, which is also on the same website, or through all of these records compiled by hand, my own table, figure out what it is I cared about, and then make sense of it. So if we can figure out a way to take the clerk's website, which actually has embedded the data we want, and make that available in a form useful to a citizen, that would be enormously helpful. If we could do a step further and either take the archived web stream of the council meeting when they actually voted on, let's say, the tax, the, the, the uh, budget and the, and the tax bill that's coming up, be a vote in November, and we could put under it in the archive, this simple table of all the aldermen's votes, it would make more meaningful what was done in web streaming or televising the actual meeting. Who knows, maybe some other media like blogs or newspapers or others would pick up the information and transmit it even more vividly to citizens. Right now, it's impossible for, uh, I mean, the newspaper kind of folks and the radio and so forth, they're there at the council meeting, and so if someone says something really outrageous, probably you'll see it on the TV that night or read it in the newspaper the next day. 
But most of this you'll never see. You'll never know what your city council, your alderman did on important legislation. So that's our proposition to all of you, is can we find a way, and uh, there is one uh, good advantage. I was at a meeting with my alderman, who's Michelle Smith, and she happens to be head of the Ethics and Government Accountability uh, Committee of the City Council. They've never had a government accountability office before, so they're not <coughs> government oversight, I'm sorry. Congress has been, spends all its time oversight of the federal government, but nobody has had oversight of the city government in, in the legislative branch. So she has agreed that we can probably do something about this. Um, the city clerk isn't automatically opposed to this, but most aldermen are, or at least they're not advancing this as an idea that citizens ought to be able to hold them accountable. So rather than give you a long, I mean, if you want, I can tell you all the workings of the city council and the machinations and how Lori Lightfoot became mayor and whatever. But maybe that's enough if we stay with just the data and what the problem is. And um, Rosera and I can answer your questions both about what is, does, you know, what would it look like to have a publicly available accountability to the city council um, and uh, maybe help strategize together and then if you want in a small group to figure it out uh, in more detail we can do that so I'm open to questions uh, this is a semi-technical question but between the two of you I think maybe one you can answer is all of the data that you would need to build the ideal searchable website already available in some way somewhere in machine readable form on the city clerk's site just in a disorganized way well, better? calling it machine readable is a little tricky. You saw that, let me see if I can back up, uh, well, even from here. So we have this yes, no information for, and, and in an average year, there are only about 50 or 60 divided roll call votes out of the 2,000. So that's there. The yeses and nos could be, the ys and ends could be switched to zeros and one, which are much easier if you're working with data. Um, you know, if you want to go from here to a histogram, you've got a couple of steps in between. Mm -hmm. But the raw data is there. It doesn't translate into an automatic spreadsheet of any sort if that, you know, so it's there, but that's what the 65 to 70 hours is, is taking this information and translating it first into machine readable then we have to compare it to the floor leader in the city council because the mayor doesn't say what her position is on many things. So we have to know what the administration's position is. And, but we can do everything if we just had this. Well, we, all we do is translate this information, which we used to take from the Journal of Proceedings, which is that giant two-volume document. So the answer is sort of yes, but it's not in a machine-readable form in the normal meaning of that. Mostly PDFs right now? Well, mostly it looks like this. And what we're trying to get to looks like the chart I showed you of zeros and ones, and then finally the histogram, and then if we were gonna make it available so you could click and know your alderman's voting record, we'd have to make another transformation, but, but doable. I have a question about, uh, this is a more technical question, I think. Um, have you approached the vendor, Legistar, to see if there's an API available for this type of information? So what we did was with a group, including Derek, um, we met with the city clerk staff when she first became city clerk, the current one we've met in the past with others. So we took a group of people like BGA and League of Women Voters, University of Illinois, Chicago, and so forth. We met with the staff and they agreed just, yeah, it's sort of a problem. And they concluded that, led, that the only way to deal with it was with the request for proposal from uh, Legistar. And they renegotiated with Legistar, but I don't think, I've never seen the proposal and we haven't gone back to meet with the city clerk since it got granted. My general, yes, the problem is Legistar's. Legistar provides most of the vote recording for most city councils and many of the state legislatures in the country. And they haven't um, 
on their own figured out a way to do what we're talking about. Now, we've not met with Legistar, but the city clerk uh, pays them millions of dollars. So theoretically, the city clerk would just say, hey, fix this. Uh, it hadn't worked that way. Now, whether that's a problem of the city clerk's office, I don't know. I mean, they've never said they didn't want to do it. They just couldn't quite get them. So they've changed staff twice. I have no idea why what seems straightforward isn't done. But it is, a, you're quite right, the, the vendor who does this is Legistar, which is not the best vendor in the world, I would comment. Can you just get Michelle Smith to write an ordinance uh, asking for this? Uh, she could probably make a phone call down to the clerk's office. But yes, she could write, the city council can certainly write, a, it's called an order. It's not an ordinance in the case of this, and it just orders an employee of the city to do X, Y, or Z. It's like an executive order. Um, we would have to be able to tell them what X, Y, and Z is, however. That is, they haven't figured out, you know, what it is we're, we want. And maybe we need to have, maybe we can do that on a small group, figure out what translating from the PDF data to something citizens would actually like uh, would, would entail in a way, because I thought they would figure it out. I thought if I, once I brought this to their attention, and um, in some previous occasions, it's been that the aldermen didn't want it. Now the aldermen are more friendly towards it, at least some aldermen are. Um, I haven't talked to the city clerk, and I don't know what their staff's position is currently. Is there an example of a municipality or a government that does exactly what you're looking for? Uh, not that I found uh, several years ago. Have you looked at any recently? Uh, they keep I, better I, records everywhere. Yeah, the, I could say that Atlanta is really good on having all their records available on their website. Um, our, every legislation, all that's proposed, everything that's passed, it's very easy to search for. Yeah, hi. Uh, so my understanding from the meetings that we were at um, is that Legistar does have this data. It's just not exposed in like a super accessible way. Uh, and so it's something that one of the things that uh, data made my company does is a website called Councilmatic that uses the Legistar API, which does exist and does have this data. Uh, and we were thinking about adding these, these roll call votes to that website. Um, that definitely seems like something that's doable. Um, and I think my question would be like, we could do that and we can make that information available. Uh, but it sounds like your point from earlier though is it's more important for the city clerk to be the one publishing that information as opposed to a third party, right? Or as opposed to the Well, university. there is a second step. In other words, once you got this into um, easy data manipulation and you could see you know, how the alderman voted on every issue, someone has to interpret that data. So when you get down to questions of histograms what does this data mean that these aldermen voted this way? That's something so far only the University of Illinois at Chicago, namely me, um, has been willing to do, the work that's involved in it. Um, we would be perfectly happy to give that up um, if somebody else would take it. In fact, we probably need to at some point, uh, but we haven't had any not-for-profit or anybody else, the city clerk doesn't want to be in the position of essentially saying the, al the aldermen who vote with the mayor are good and the aldermen who vote against the mayor are bad or vice versa. So there is a second level, because for citizens it's really useful to know what is the city, how well is the whole city council behaving and what is it, you know, what, how, what that percentage table, this table, the percent the aldermen vote with the mayor and this histogram are things the city clerk is, wouldn't do and probably shouldn't do, but some third party, the university or someone needs to help with that so that you have an instant available snapshot of how are we doing. You may, you know, you could like, you know, if they're voting 100% with the mayor, you could hate if they're voting 100% of the mayor, but knowing they're doing that tells you a lot about the city council and the health of the city. To follow that up, Bob, uh, are there other, uh, uh, in other cities, are there groups doing exactly what you, asked, you said? No. It's a short, it's an easy question to answer. You might ask why aren't there, but that's a different. 
Mike. One thing to remember is that not all cities have the same form of government. Um, so uh, Chicago, we have what's com commonly referred to as a, as a strong mayor form of government where we don't have a hired city manager. So some of the things, that analysis that we do wouldn't be applicable to other cities because they have a different type of government. So voting with the mayor isn't as significant for doing a litmus test for the, for the politics of the overall council. Um, I'm guessing the concern right now is more for the current session of, of city council, but um, I'm wondering about how important historical records are to the onslaught. So I have a book called Rogues, Rebels, and Rubber Stamps, which covers selected years um, since um, we, it covers the period that it's much earlier, but, but it covers mostly the 20th century. So if you want to know in general, and councils have behaved differently. We used to have the Council of Gray Wolves when every, the power was in the council and not in the mayor's office. And we have selected years like 1928 uh, to look at, and we have done the calculations. And since Mayor Richard J. Daley, which is 1955, we have covered every mayor since 1955. We've covered selective mayors uh, back earlier. Going back to, actually, I have one from 1863. So we have some Civil War councils and some early councils, but those are big gaps in between because uh, collecting the data is equally hard 100 years ago as it is today. In fact, it hadn't improved basically uh, in the 150 year history of the city except to finally number the ordinances, finally uh, cable television, the legislative session, and to produce what I showed you on the clerk's website, which is a slight improvement over 150 years ago. So I have a question I'd like to ask. That Maybe it'll help give some context to people are here that might be less familiar with your work. Um, you said it was about 60 to 70 man hours to enter in the data for the divided roll call vote. So I'm, I'm kind of curious what you would do with those hours if you didn't have to do that. And by way of asking, what else is it that you focus on? Okay. So actually, um, Rosera spends the 65 to 70 hours. I spend 10 or 20. <laughs> Uh, working with him to write up the reports, which we publish at the University of Illinois, Chicago, a website called Chicago Politics. Uh, some of the other studies we do uh, uh, have to do with corruption, a book called Corrupt Illinois, uh, and a series of reports. Uh, you'll be pleased to know we are number one, that is, we're the most corrupt city in the nation, um, and, but statistically. Uh, we've had 2,100 uh, public corruption convictions in Illinois since 1972. Um, and uh, fortunately for Chicago, 1,800 of them have been here in the metropolitan region. Uh, by the way, they're suburban, not just Chicago. We also study suburban government, we study Cook County government, and I write on elections and write on uh, other issues about democracy in America, um, all of which can be pretty gloomy topics. Doesn't that mean that we just get caught the most? <laughs> no, it doesn't. Uh, it works the other way. We have the most, um, the largest U.S. attorney and FBI offices because there's so many corrupt officials. It takes two teams instead of one, which is all any other region has, uh, to keep up with the level of corruption. Uh, we have about 50 cases of convictions each year in the state of Illinois of public corruption. Some of them you're aware of current indictments like Alderman Burke and so forth. We got two questions from the docs, both of which are great. One of which is technically three questions, but we'll start with the first one. Uh, so someone asked, have you considered looking at how often council members agree or disagree, not just with the mayor, but also with each other? We automatically see whether they agree with or without, with, we just do it by measuring. you. You could do, um, uh, we have done other kinds of statistics. We've done factor analysis of the council and so forth. That's very useful in Congress uh, because it breaks into issues like foreign policy, or used to. Congress is so bad now, I don't think it works anymore, but I haven't seen a recent study. But it used to break into one set of people would agree on with each other in groups and domestic policy and foreign policy and so forth. Uh, in the city council, that's never been true. It's never been subject-driven. 
So you can look at housing or economic development or a subject area, and you'll probably find roughly the same divisions um, of aldermen across issues. They don't seem to vary on that as, I mean, they do some, but not, not in a statistical way that's useful. So uh, the short answer, I'd be glad for someone to redo it and see if something has changed, and we may get something different in the Lightfoot administration. We haven't yet because there haven't been enough disagreement with the mayor, uh, but I'm expecting big disagreement to come with the budget and taxes, and then we'll see after that. So, next question would be, what exactly is a floor leader? Okay, let me answer them one at a time. So, the, f uh, the head of the finance committee is the most powerful alderman of the city council. If you think of, um, uh, people like the Speaker of the House of Representatives and so forth, the, the leaders of the parties in Congress or the state legislature, uh, when it's for the administration, they're called the floor leader in generic terminology about legislature. So it's the person the mayor trusts. So to go back to the Emanuel administration, it was Alderman Burke. Under Mayor Lightfoot, uh, it is Alderman Scott Walsbach. Um, they, and the Finance Committee handles 80 or 90 percent of the critical legislation because it has to do with money. You can't hardly do nothing without money. And uh, so the Finance Chair is the most important single member. There is sometimes a separate political floor leader. There was under the Emanuel administration, so we actually took the two votes of the political floor leader uh, and the um, governmental floor leader and made sure they agreed and they did in all but one case. So the, since the mayor doesn't speak, doesn't vote, the mayor doesn't have a vote unless it's a tie, when we wanna compare votes of the first ward alderman to the mayor, we can't because the mayor didn't vote on the question. So we look at the floor leader's vote as a surrogate for the mayor, just to be able to make sense out of what's going on and, and so many different issues across so many different questions. Okay, that goes pretty well with this next part of this same question. Um, what do you wish the average Chicagoan understood about how city council works? Um, my sense is that, and this is from having been an alderman and having studied it for 40 years, is the city council doesn't work as well as it should, and therefore our democracy in Chicago is undermined because the council doesn't play its correct legislative role. Part of it is the aldermen don't offer legislation. They offer things like stop signs and service legislation, but not citywide legislation. Um, and so the more you understand about the city council, the more critical you can be about why isn't it doing its function as the legislative check and balance and as the proposer of new ideas. Um, the roll call votes is just a way of guess, doing a snapshot. What's it doing? How is it done since Mayor Lightfoot became mayor? You could look at the votes and you can answer that question. You know, whether you like what they do or not is a, is a different part of that, but you can at least tell what they did. Chicago has about 77 official neighborhoods and about 50 wards. And I was curious, what do you think is the best method for rearranging the wards in a way in which they aren't, uh, you know, gerrymandered and uh, jiggered to be strategically to the alderman advantage? So, um, and it's even worse with state legislative districts and congressional districts in Illinois. But in the case of the wards in the city council, we get the, the census is taken next March, 2020. Um, about a year later, we'll have enough census data to redraw the boundaries of the wards. About 55,000 people in each ward, give or take a few. Depends on how many people we lose between now and March, leaving the city, uh, and a few other things. But uh, the, we do not use an independent commission to draw the boundaries. The aldermen draw the boundaries, which means who has political clout names the boundaries. So to take a, an ethnic community example, Chinatown, I think, has four, or part of four wards. So it's very hard for Asians to have legitimate representation in the city council. We had one Asian American, we now have none. I think I'm right on that. Um, Latinos are underrepresented in the city. I'm just using racial groups before I even get to what about a community like Inglewood or so forth that they, do they have? Communities like those of us who live on the north side 
Lincoln Park is a pretty contiguous neighborhood. Lakeview is and has a ward that roughly parallels the neighborhood. But on the south and west side and on the worst ward in Chicago, I suppose, is the second ward, um, which does look like a salamander or something. It's a really weird shape going across six, seven, eight communities. Um, it, it's uh, very important to Lincoln Yards, by the way. Uh, but so your question is the city council is going to do it. The mayor may have a strong voice in it. If you want an independent commission, you've got to get the city council to vote to do that. I can't imagine they will, but it's a, a fight worth having. Preventing gerrymandering is one of the major structural changes that will help some parts of American democracy, not just the city council, but the state legislative races. I've seen one of the state legislative districts that goes from the loop, uh, the Senate district goes all the way to 103rd Street down the lake. There are a few communities in there, none of them have much to do with each other, you know, until you get into the all black area way down. And, and even that's not very, you know, very different communities you're going across. A lot of difference between Kenwood and, and Hyde Park. So let me ask you a question. Is, it, is this a problem worth fixing? Or is this just something us academicians, you know, mess around with and it doesn't really matter? Yes, I think it's worth fixing. I think uh, we as a democracy on all spectrum, as far as political, social, or economic, have a responsibility to it. So if that being the case, I think we all can put a little bit more effort, roll up our sleeves and do a little bit more. Okay. My question is, how does the mechanism of automatic privilege or the climate for it in city council uh, impact what you all are trying to do? So aldermanic privilege per se doesn't, and aldermanic privilege has been fixed when it has to do with permits uh, by the mayor's executive order. I was there when Lori signed the ordinance because I'd been on the transition team uh, designing the idea of fixing the aldermanic privilege. Uh, there's some other things that got fixed later in the city council ordinance on ethics. Uh, including outside jobs, but it's really what you're really asking about is aldermanic clout. The aldermen have kept this from being fixed, um, not with ever having to do anything. They didn't have to make a speech. They didn't have to, they just, the clerk sort of bowed to the wish of the aldermen. For instance, the committees, when we were on the clerk's website, I won't roll back there, you'll see for the first time full committee reports. Committees didn't, they, they could report if they felt like it. They do in the council when they say, we voted, you know, 12 to two to recommend ordinance number 107. But in a sense of a formal report of what their committee meeting did, we didn't have records required. They weren't even required to provide agendas in advance. Some of that is changing, but this part hasn't changed yet. And I don't know whether the aldermen, I mean, we've got some new aldermen. I think there are 11 new aldermen. There are 18 aldermen in the uh, uh, Progressive Caucus. There's some things different about this city council. Whether they're different enough to fix all the problems you might be concerned about, I don't know. That's a work in progress. Um, we have a question from the doc. Uh, can you see evidence of corruption in these votes? If so, what would it look like? If not, what other information do you need to see corruption? So there's, um, what you can see is how the alderman voted. What you can't see is, did someone slip the alderman an envelope with $500 in it for their vote? Or did they uh, sponsor, did they help get the bill, through, the ordinance through the committee meeting? So you need more information than the fact they voted yes or no. But if, it can be shown, let's say, um, I am um, uh, head of the finance committee, as Alderman Burke happened to have been, and a client of mine paid me money to work on his company's behalf, and that company, in fact, 
passed legislation that gave them profit. And the company also gave me a campaign contribution, which I can look up, um, mostly. Uh, that would be grounds for a corruption conviction. Now, you'd have to prove those links, but the information with your, so you'd have to put several pieces of information. It's not enough that the alderman voted yes or no, and I don't like how they voted. For that, you get to vote them out of office if you don't like how they voted. But that they were guilty of corruption, you have to have more evidence than they voted. You have to show that they, the, defin the definition for corruption is the, the use of one's public office for private gain. So if you can show that an alderman did something like passed legislation or introduced an ordinance or something and got the equivalent of a bribe, whether it came as a campaign contribution, um, an envelope of money, uh, a client who paid law fees, things like that, you can build a case for corruption. But it's not, the vote itself isn't evidence of corruption, no matter how they voted yes, no, okay. abstain. Just, just, just to add on the last one, so we had one anomaly, and that was that the floor leader didn't vote with the finance committee that Professor Sid was talking about, O'Connor. And during that, I was trying to research why there was a case. We never get, get to the bottom of it. But it did involve a zoning change. And it was just him and one other person who went out on a limb and said to vote against it. And O'Connor was one of those aldermen who was accused of, even though no one came up, it was, there was kind of a, a cloud of suspicion around him that uh, he was perhaps approving zoning changes that developers wanted because he, as a lawyer, would represent the developers. So there's nothing we can approve, but it was one of those things like, well, this is an anomaly. Why would this occur? And if you had the information up, you could look for those anomalies and it would make the whole system more transparent to deal with corruption. Last question. Um, sorry if you already said this, but about how many of uh, those PDF documents would you estimate we'll have to go through in order to get the data we want? Well, since there are only 60 divided row, depending on what you want, but assuming, assuming you just want the basic, uh, there are only 60 divided roll call votes a year. So roughly six, the, and those PDF documents are usually two pages. So you could get most of it from 60 times two, maybe. Uh, we haven't, that'd be a pretty good guess. Somewhere around 100 pages of separate PDFs. And the undeliverable was just a website people could go to with like the histograms and such that you're talking about? So there'd be two deliverables. One would be the city clerk's website would post the kind of information about what the actual vote was in a table that would be easily searchable by aldermen and easily uh, understood by citizens looking at the table. And um, the next deliverable would have to be a third party like our university that would analyze this and say it produces this histogram and it produces this other understanding of what the, uh, what the votes mean. So the what the votes mean is a separate operation, but just what the votes are in an easily digestible, for, searchable form is probably 100 pages of PDFs or something like that. Cool. Thanks. All right, thank you very much. Uh, another round of applause. <laughs>